Hey Axis and Allies players, the good captain here. Welcome to episode two in my Axis and Allies clinic series. In this video, I'm gonna be going over the opener for Japan's first turn in Axis and Allies Classic and the statistics associated with that opener. And just like in the previous video, I'll do the Don Ray essays version of Japan's opener first, followed by my own recommendation. So two quick points of housekeeping before we get the camera aimed at the board. So number one, I get all the information regarding the probabilities from a specific battle calculator, and that's the one found on AAA. And number two is that if rolling out these stats is not that interesting to you, fear not. The next three videos I'm releasing in this series have almost nothing to do with statistics whatsoever. Okay, that's it. Let's go ahead and get the camera aimed at the board and see what's going on. Okay, welcome to Japan's first turn in Axis and Allies Classic. Now, in the Don Ray world, the Russians have a blocker in the Soviet Far East, six infantry in Yakut, and one armor in Novozibirsk. The British will have been reinforced. The idea in Don Ray's essays is to build an industrial complex as the UK player. So whatever was in Africa will have been brought over by this transport, and there will actually be more pieces here. It's not necessary for this demonstration to have it exact. Unless the British have vacated India, we will not be attacking it. Of course, the Americans haven't gone yet, so the Japanese will go straight into their combat move. Again, we're not worried about purchases in this video. We just want to cover the stats of the opening moves. So in the Don Ray essays, it states to move all three infantry from Manchuria into China, two from Kwangtung, and one from French Indochina Burma. That makes six infantry. And now we'll add in three fighters. One from French Indochina, one from Manchuria, and one from Japan. And finally, we execute the attack around the Hawaiian Islands with one sub, one carrier, two fighters, one, two, three, four, two battleships, and one bomber, one, two, three. Since the balance of this video is going to be a discussion about the attack around the Hawaiian Islands, let's start first with China. So in this fight, as we have it set up here on the board with six infantry and three fighters, this is a 99.5% chance of success or better. And in that regards, it's interesting to see what the probability is of killing all three of these pieces in the first round of combat. And as we have it here, there's actually a 48% chance that all three American units are wiped out in the first round of combat. So more times than not, the Japanese player is gonna lose two infantry here. The percentages on that are a little vague, but it looks like it's about 80 to 85% certainty that the Japanese lose two pieces. So that's all I really have for this battle. Let's now move over to the other combat. All right, before we go any further, I wanna say that this is one of the most popular moves I see Japanese players executing on their first round. I guess I can see why. The American units are high value units, especially this fighter and carrier, and the Japanese odds are 99.5% or better with this setup. But I feel very strongly that this attack is deeply flawed and that the Japanese player is much better off not doing it on the first turn. So we're gonna go through this right now, but before I do, I wanna bring over two pieces from Eastern United States, and that's just to keep them in the front of our mind. On the Eastern United States, there is a bomber and a fighter that are both in range of the Hawaiian Islands. And for those of you who can't see where I'm going with this, there is a potential American counterattack. The American player will have at least five pieces to counterattack with. That's two three attackers and two four attackers. So with that as a foundation, let's go now into the root of the problem. So like I said earlier, this battle is 99.5% effective. So the next thing we need to ask is, what is the percentage chance of us actually killing all three of these American units on the first round of combat. If we're using low luck, this is overkill, right? Like there would be no need to roll dice. We have a 21 point attack. That's technically three and a half kills. But the reality is there's an 80% chance with this attacking force that the Japanese secure three hits on the first round of combat. So yes, most of the time the Japanese will kill all three, but one in five games, they will not. And if the American player only has to select two casualties, it absolutely 100% should be the American carrier and American fighter. You want this unit to survive. 
it's critical to understand the rules of Axis and Allies Classic. And in Axis and Allies Classic, submarines can retreat between rounds of combat. That means all three of these units can return fire like normal, and then surviving submarines of either side, attacker first, may withdraw from the combat. So the Japanese its submarine, if it survived, could go to any sea zone from which attacking naval units came from. But defending submarines are a little different. They can go to any vacant sea zone or friendly occupied sea zone. So in the case where only two hits were scored as the Japanese player, the American player would throw dice back at the Japanese. And regardless of what damage was inflicted, the American submarine could retreat to, say, Midway Island Sea Zone. I like to retreat here because we project some dead zone power into the Japan Sea Zone. But the reason you're doing this as the American player is to put the screws on this Japanese fleet. We'll get into what kind of casualties the Japanese can expect to take when conducting this attack. But suffice it to say that the Japanese are highly likely to take at least one casualty, and that casualty is of course going to be the submarine. During the non-combat movement phase, the bomber will have to fly off, and the Japanese will be left with the pieces you see here. And on the very next turn now, the Americans have an opportunity, and that's to move one, two fighters, a battleship, a transport, and a submarine along with this bomber, into the Hawaiian Island Sea Zone. And this attacking American force has a 60% chance outright of destroying all the Japanese units around the Hawaiian Islands with at least one surviving piece left over. There's an 8% chance of a draw. That's where both sides wipe each other out. And there's a 32% chance that at least one Japanese unit survives to claim a victory for Japan. If the American submarine survives, I'm doing this attack every time. I have the attacker option of always retreating if the battle starts to go sideways. At least two of these units can and should be considered fodder type units. And whatever kills we get against Japan is gonna sting really badly. These are high value pieces and Japan has one of the lowest starting incomes in the game. Now, if you're thinking, well, that sub is probably not going to survive anyway, 80% is good enough that I'll hang my hat on it. Let me show you one other terrible thing that can happen to the Japanese player. Okay, I've gone ahead and reset the battle. And this next example here I'm about to show you is more common and more devastating to the Japanese player. So let's say the Japanese attacking force manages to kill all three American units in the first round of combat. The percentage of an American response getting two hits approaches 50-50. It's not quite 50%, but almost 50% of the time, the Americans will inflict two hits. And the problem here is with casualty selection. So obviously the Japanese are going to take the submarine as the first hit, and if they were forced to take a second, the natural instinct is to remove a fighter, right? Because it's the next cheapest unit. Losing a carrier or a battleship or even a bomber is far more expensive than replacing a fighter. But if at the end of the turn you look something like this around the Hawaiian Islands, well, I've got bad news for you. A counterattacking force of two fighters, a bomber, a battleship, and a transport has a 65% chance of winning a battle outright against the Japanese in this state, a 10% chance of mutual destruction, and a 25% chance that at least one Japanese unit survives the battle. So in short, there's a 75% chance that if the Americans pull the trigger on this counterattack, that all these Japanese units will be destroyed. The nightmare scenario that can happen is this. That the American submarine survives and the Japanese only have three four defenders and one three defender. In this worst case scenario, the Americans have a 90% chance of a win, a 3% chance of a draw, and a 7% chance of a loss. So in summation, the only way this Japanese fleet is going to be relatively safe is if they have two fighters on that carrier, two battleships, and the American submarine is removed from play. But even in this situation, an American counterattack isn't completely off the table. Two fighters, a bomber, a battleship, and a transport hitting this Japanese setup still has a 25% chance of success, a 9% chance of all units of both sides being destroyed, and a 66% chance of a Japanese win. So a Japanese player that pulls this move in Axis and Allies Classic is placing a rather risky bet. One, they're betting that they get all three American units in the first round of combat. Two, they're betting that the Americans don't inflict more than one hit on the attacking Japanese. And three, they're betting that the Americans won't be bold enough 
to counterattack regardless. So those are the stats on this very common attack. One interesting note here is that in the Don Ray essays, it actually states that if a second casualty is received by the Japanese, that you should take the bomber as the casualty. So it seems that even the essays written way back when seem to comprehend the importance of having at a bare minimum the fleet units and air units you see here around the Hawaiian Islands at the end of J1. And though I'm a big fan of never doing this attack, I will say that if you, the viewer, are going to insist on doing this, do not bring a bomber. You can actually bring a third fighter, just barely. You can bring the one off Japan, the one off the Philippines, and the one that starts out on the carrier can actually fly into wake. So you can have three fighters here. And that is, in my opinion, the stronger attack. It bumps the percentage chance of getting all three kills in the first round down by 5% from 80 to 75%. But at least it ensures that there will be at least two fighters on the deck to help repel any kind of counterattack. And for anyone thinking that bringing the Japanese transport as an additional soak yeah, that's true, but now you're really starting to eat away at your own empire, right? You got a lot of work to do with transports, and mobility killing so many units that are vitally needed on the Asian mainland is a victory for the Allies by another means. So that's pretty much it. I've decided I'm not going to reset the board and show you how I do the first round. It's pretty much the same, just minus the Hawaiian Islands strike. I do add in the bomber into this China battle, this ups the chance that we get all three American units in the first round of combat from 48% to 68%. And that, of course, helps reduce the chance that the Americans score uh, two hits against our infantry. If you'd like to know more about the Japan strategy for Axis and Allies Classic, check out the link in the description box below. So we'll go ahead and wrap up. In this video, we discuss the common J1 opening moves for Axis and Allies Classic, Milton Bradley 2nd Edition. We discussed the attack into the Hawaiian Islands Sea Zone in detail. I demonstrated what I believe are serious flaws in that attack. One, that the Japanese don't get all three kills on the first round of combat. Two, that the Americans score two hits on the return fire. Three, both the submarine survives and the Americans score two hits on the return fire. And overall, I hope I stress the necessity that the Japanese truly need to make sure they have two fighters on that carrier deck along with those battleships at the end of the fight, at the very least. That concludes this video. I hope to see you in the next Axis and Allies Clinic. I will be going over Global 40, how to do the J1 attack. Thanks for watching this. All the best from the good captain, and bye-bye.